This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. This week, we take you on two voyages of discovery and the mix of pessimism and hope we find along the way. For news anchor Imran Garda, covering the past few years for Al Jazeera and other networks, has seen an Arab Spring flow into a refugee crisis. His novel travels around Africa and beyond to bring us a story in the midst of the story with the thunder that roars. And then Mira Subramanian visited India, the land of her father, to explore the way the world's largest democracy was coping with environmental problems and how some Indians hope to forge a new path. She tells her story in A River Runs Again, India's Natural World in Crisis, from the barren cliffs of Rajasthan to the farmlands of Karnataka. But first, here's my interview with Imran Garda. So a journalist who's full of himself, self-serving, uses other people. I, I don't know anyone <laughs> like that, right? I, I, you're, this is the main character of your novel. How did you discover that there could be such a person in the world? Maybe uh, part of it was a confession or a... Um, <laughs> Or just to irritate my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, clearly um, the, the lead character, Yusuf, um, emerges from the same context, right? Um, and I wanted that, and I wanted that sort of guessing game with people wondering, how much of you is in this book? Um, how much of your friends? Um, and the truth is, maybe there's a bit of me, maybe there's a bit of friends, family, a lot of the men I've known in my life through uncles, uh, um, uh, men I've, I've come across in the workplace, uh, I chipped off little bits mm, from other people, uh, so, and, I, and some of them were uh, aggregated into different aspects of uh, Yusuf's personality. And one thing about this journalist, Yusuf, who's the, the main character here that I think, that, that surprised me just as a person, as a journalist, and someone who's, who knows a lot of journalists, that he's a very faithful man, which I don't find very often. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the idea that he, he's really struggling with his belief in God when he finds catastrophe in the world, when he, he a lot of this deals with some of the Arab Spring and some of the spillover of violence uh, and, and difficulties with, with immigration and so forth. And he, he's actually trying to, to square that circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's a young man. He's in his 20s. He's, he's um, asking questions um, and confronting these things that he had not confronted before. Um, so faith is that one thing that you sort of take for granted and you do your thing and it's sort of more of a cultural expression but you, you know you so if you grow up a a, a Muslim a and in his case a sort of upper middle class Muslim in Johannesburg South Africa there are certain things that you do that keep you a part of the tribe and nobody questions your faith so you know you you pray Friday Juma and you you know don't drink publicly and you try not to um, you try to keep your belief system intact right if you believe all the things that you're supposed to believe but then there's another side to you which is just the young human being um, exploring the world having sex um, um, living in this uh, cosmopolitan world and I think catastrophe, as, as you called it, and these major earthquakes in his life, both internally and externally, and this journey, these journeys that he's taking both internally and externally, force him to kind of confront some of this. But then the question is, do you actually allow, do you actually interrogate your own beliefs and wonder, am I right? Or is it all relative? Um, do you really deal with it or do you just find a way to, to, to compartmentalize it, put it away and carry on with your life? There's this element there of kind of, in what you were just saying, where you know, it's, he's coasting along and finding these new truths, but he's incorporating them at a very rapid pace and what it means to be confronted with things that just very much blow up your worldview. Yeah, I mean, I think um, what I wanted to do with this book um, was... Um, upend the generic story of privilege, pampered kid faces the reality of the world, changes immediately. Catharsis. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. I think people then tend to find a way to exploit that even. <laughs> 
you know, oh, I went, I, I, and I see it now, and maybe I'm just too cynical. I see people, you know, finding a way to build their own brand off the backs of Syrian refugees, you know, and, and other stories. And I think that's part of the uncomfortable um, reality that I try to inject into it that I'm not so sure people confront these things and then change and make amends and for the rest of their lives that they're, they're, they're different people. Um, I'm not so sure. I've seen people go through iterations of it. I've seen people absorb aspects of it, but also exploit the mere fact that they are on this journey. And now, Mira Subramanian on how a river can be made to run again. Wherever we go around the world, we find one constant. People mess it up. They do, and, and, then, and then the flip side of that is that some people try to fix it. And so that, actually that's like, in a nutshell, that was what I was trying to do with this book, is that India is this place where we've got huge population pressures meeting limited natural resources in a way that arguably everyone is going to face if they're not facing it already. And so I went, I went looking for the people who were trying to unmess it up. Each country that has formed itself into a democracy or into, uh, into some kind of self-governing mechanism, you can point to when they joined that, that club and say, and, and show how they were marked by that era. Yeah. And India yeah. joined that period at a time, and it is very much marked by that era. India became independent and formed a democracy, like you're saying, the largest democracy on, in the world. But they did it in a particularly Indian way. And so they uh, drew on their own history and their own legacy of, of South Asians. They didn't just take the Western model of democracy and just exactly replicate it. So. So I started thinking about, could India be developing also in a different way? I mean, right now, Prime Minister Modi is, uh, and the direction seems to be to replicate the mistakes of the past. And even they've been hesitant to make climate promises. And we always hear, you know, well, the US and all these other places got to develop big uh, mega dams and nuclear power plants and coal-fired power plants to get all these resources that we use up now. And now it's China and India's turn. So we hear that argument a lot. and. Uh, but we know how that story plays out. We know that that leads to like really excessive pollution. We know that those resources that are tapped into run out, and then you're you're kind of stuck. And he, so I, I guess it, I started realizing that there was maybe an opportunity that India may or may not be taking about trying to develop a new model of sustainable development. When you look at, for example, you, look, you take a deep look at farming, yeah. and, and you talk about the Green Revolution, when developing countries all around the globe in the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. got all these modern farming techniques right. and modern farming, farming chemicals and modern farming machines right. that we now know have have major trade-offs for the surrounding country at right. least, and for the people working in the land. Right, right. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, some people are like, wait, I thought the Green Revolution was just this miracle. And it's like, in some respects, it was. It fed a lot of people. And, and, um, and famine hasn't happened in India since then. But uh, malnutrition is still widespread. There are still, you know, more malnutrition there than in sub-Saharan Africa. So it hasn't fully solved those problems. And exactly like you said, the questions of like, what, co what, what price did we pay to get those, um, those yields? And then the follow-up question is, how long can we even sustain those yields? And already it's clear that, that um, the methods plateau and then sometimes even decrease. And so then you're on, you're on the hamster wheel of like, what's the next thing we're gonna do to, um, deal with the chemicals that we put on that the, the insects then dealt with evolution to, to figure out ways around those things and then the pests come back. What new chemicals are you going to do? And in the meanwhile, the water table has gone down. The water that is there is polluted. You've got health crises and a cancer rate that is higher than national averages in places like Punjab, like the, the breadbasket of India. So yeah, it's asking those questions like, what? how can we do this differently? 
That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Link Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on TV channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.